Okay. We have our uh, little things outside on the door. Yes. Yes. I, I didn't bother to take it off. Today's date, December 6, 1994. The survivor, Leopold Page. The interviewer, Bronco Lustig. The city, Beverly Hills, California. The language, English. Okay. Tell us, please, your name and uh, where are you born and when, the date. My name is Leopold. Original name is Leopold Pfefferberg. I was born on March the 20th, 1913, in Kraków, Podgórze, the most beautiful town in, in that whole Poland, old, over a thousand years old. I was born to a beautiful, middle-class Jewish family, religious. My grandparents were very religious. My parents were religious too, not orthodox, but conservative. I have a beautiful youth. I was the first in the family of my grandfather's family, but I was 11 brother and sister. I was the oldest grandson, and I was like a treasure for my grandfather. And you had uh, some brothers, sisters? Yeah, three years later, my sister was born on February 9, 1916. This time my father was not present during the birth of my sister. He was already drafted to the Austrian army during the First World War. And we didn't know in this time when he was located. We found a few months later after my sister was born that he was wounded in the western, northwestern part of Poland. What was your father's occupation? My father, first my father's name was David Pfefferberg. My father was a representative of company from Germany in this particular time. Has a sales office in the city of Krakow and represent uh, Biber and Eike. This company was importing uh, goods from South America like coffee, tea, nuts, and raisins and other types of uh, normal uh, imports from this part of the world and was doing very well but the war started in 1914 and he was drafted and till got wounded in 1916 and then he was released my father uh, 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 the family of my father was very well known uh, jewish family of city of krakow for centuries his family was consistent of about nine sister and brother he was the oldest one when he finished 18, when he was 18 years of age and finished high school, he went to America in 1905 because the family has a relatives, cousin and uncle someplace in New York. I never found them. Lately, I'm getting now some uh, uh, feeling back that they are from the family of Krakow, of Pfefferberg. Uh, my father spent seven years in America. The family was wealthy here in America, but they give him a chance only to stay with them about the month, and then they said, you are on your own. He got a job in Metropolitan Opera in New York, in the chorus. He has a beautiful tenor voice, and he was singing over there. <laughs> when he came back to Krakow? He, he came back because as the oldest son, his father got gra gravy ill in 1912, and my father returned to support the family. And my grandfather, I never knew my grandfather from my father's side because I was born in 1913, he died in 1912. But I was, my name, Leopold, is after my grandfather from my father's side. My sister was born in 1916 and her name was after the grandmother from my mother's side. And their name was Pauline. And when your father came back, uh, he continued to work? My, when my father, I don't know exactly, because he was a very young man in his 20s. He came back and he met by coincidence his future wife, who also went from very prominent Jewish family, middle class family, uh, from family named Goldfluss. Moses Goldfluss was my grandfather. All very well situated. And they got married, and I was born 
in a short time, about exactly nine or ten months after they got married, because I was they married in 1912, and I was born in, in 1913 in March. But when he came back from the war, yes, my father. Yes, then he. My father, when he came from the war, in the 20s, you must remember when he was wounded, he was released. But in 1920, the Bolsheviks invited the Poland, so he was called to the Polish army, you understand? So the whole period of time since 1914 till 1921, he was mostly on and off from the army. He couldn't make any living, but my mother was very talented interior decorated, so she was supporting the family. In the beginning, we were living together in my grandfather, Moses Goldfluss, my mother's father and, and mother. We were living in the beginning in their house. They have a big farm, not far away from the uh, city of Krakow in Podgusze. And uh, later on, when she started making a good living, we take a port apartment in, in Podgusze on the main street of Limanowska Street. It was a Jewish court. A lot of Jews was living in Podgusze, right? Uh, there was not only in Podgusze. The Krakow has, in this particular period of time, close to about 60,000, what grew later on to about 75, 80,000 population many, before the war. How many synagogues were in Krakow? Oh, they were quite a bit synagogues. The main was the, the temple, what exists even today. But the rest of them, small shuls, you know, depending on your wealth and on your status in the community, you belong to certain schools that have the similar group of Jews, prominent type of Jews. And my father belonged to the alt, Alter Shul, to the old. And school. you went to the Shul? We were, I was going to the Shul till I became 18 years of age and when I graduated from high school and went to the university. I went on the shore to the big holidays. I, on account of the sentiment, on account of this, uh, my father was uh, still a conservative Jew. You understand? I went to the So shore. you finished the high school in Krakow? Yeah, I finished. There was a Jewish high school? Is there, you know, let me tell you something about my father. He didn't have a university degree, but he has a high school degree, you see? But he was extremely talented, spoke fluently flu few languages, Polish, German, English, uh, Hebrew, Yiddish. And in writing and speaking. And he wrote beautifully. My father was very talented in writing. I don't have the talent. But you, you went to a Jewish high school? No. I was one of the lucky ones that went to the government high school. That means free of paying free of charge. I went to the high school in the city of Podgusze, very prominent high school, and it was difficult. There's not like here high school here. Gymnasium was a much, much higher level because the classes when I was I was ten years old when I went to the first class of gymnasium, we have already three languages. German, Latin, and Greek. And how many how many Jews were with you on this? In, coincidentally, it was substantial amount. In the class was of, roughly uh, between thirty five and forty students. Was about fifty percent was the Jewish student. And how was the between the Poles? We didn't Christian? have no problem in a, in a high school with anything uh, like uh, against the Jews or things. The only problem was this: to get to the gymnasium, you have to be a B plus student minimum. When, for example, general public, the Catholic students, could get the minute they are entitled to go, they were accepted. We have to go, go everybody has to go to the entry examination. But it was much more difficult to pass for the Jewish boy. Was, the demand was much bigger because they have to eliminate it. According to the status of Poland, uh, because in Poland, in average, was between three and three and a half million Jewish population before the uh, uh, between first and second war. Uh, the quotas was quotas for the uh, school ten percent was easier to get to a, a government school for the Jewish boy went because we are excelling in, a, in a studying. <laughs> we knew to to stay in the school you have to be very good. And then you went to university. When the you university, the quota was very strict. Particular 
to the things like medical school, uh, and the Department of Physical Education School was easier to get to law or to other uh, uh, department with def different qualification. Engineering was very difficult to get in. And what uh, what you went to? What kind? I went to medical school. Does it mean the medical school with a special I implementation to the physical education? But this was all more like preparing this young people to a teaching in a high school, a gymnasium, or university. When you became a master degree or doctor degree, you could go and teach in the university. I got only up to master degree, uh, and, and I have master degree in education from the University of Krakow. And I became a teacher in 1934. The minute I finished high school, I already got a job. Hey, because you? there were no Jewish. No high school, you mean the university? And, and they, no, job in a high school. Even the first year I was in a Polish high school, because when they sent me for the practice on the first year, I was assigned to the high school, which I four years before graduate. And all my ex-teachers became my colleagues. And it was a little bit strange, but I built a pretty good reputation over there. They, you have, uh, your sister also went to the, to the government no, school? No, with my sister it was a little bit difficult. She couldn't get to the government school because there were not too many uh, 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 girl high school. You remember that in Poland in this time was not co-education, not co-ed. So they were men's, boys, gymnasium and girl. And the amount of boys gymnasium was three times as many as a girl. It was difficult to get for my sister. You, had, do, you didn't have other brothers? or No. Sisters? My sister went to the Hebrew gymnasium, where the extremely hard high school on a very high scholastic level, you have to be, because they have to to graduate high school. In this time, the high school was eight years long. Later on, the, the division came between junior and high and liceo. You have to be a very good student to pass the examination of all the general classes, what every high school has to go through plus also Hebrew classes where they have an extra curriculum in Hebrew, in language and religion Tell me, and so forth. When you finished the university and you went 1934, you was a member of some Jewish organization? This only I was a member of Jewish uh, uh, school or university, uh, but not they were not political organization. They were mostly uh, more like a fun and game and meeting people and have not Zionist, Zionist groups. A school, there was high school, uh, how we call this? There was Jewish high school organization. Yeah, but there was some uh, groups of uh, Jewish organization, they were like Zionist. Uh, uh, no, you see, no, I didn't belong to any political type of group. Hmm? Not to the Zionists, not to Betar, not to any of them. I belonged to the sport organization Maccabi, that was very well uh, organized uh, sport organization because I was a, uh, I would say, extraordinary sportsman in every field. So what I heard, I was swimmer and I was, was skier, a skier, right? Skier and swimmer and hockey player and. Uh, Where you accomplished the, uh, you was a very good skier, right? Yes, excellent. I became first Jew in the Polish national. Uh, ski association that had reached the rank of the instructor, a full pledge instructor of teaching sk skiing. But for me, as a teacher in physical education, was a very important because I could make extra money by teaching children or anybody else. And how was your pa you were living with your family, with your mother and father still? During your uh, when you 1934. Oh, I stayed with my family. I never. Uh, you never. Uh, I still at home. I have a wonderful family, uh, warm relationship with my parents and with my sister. And we were very, extremely loving uh, family. My parents protect us and shelter us and try to do everything possible for the children. And you, when when you heard first time something that uh, in Europe, in in Germany and in Austria and all around the Europe, they start to prosecute Jews and. It's a, it's a interesting question that you are asking me to answer. In my youth, in my youth, I never saw any uh, anti-Semitic uh, 
against me personally. There were some story what you hear that something happened. Sometimes maybe over exaggerate because the antisemitism in Poland, what we consider was the biggest country with the biggest antisemitism, is very over over exaggerate. Poland, in general term, was not more or less antisemitic than in Germany or France. I even consider the Frenchmen and Englishmen and German more antisemitic inclined because they do this in a white gloves. And a Polak, when he didn't like you, he told you, you are the Jews, and this was everything but over. But when the first time you heard about, about uh, things was going on in Germany against the Jews, Oh, this, I, I watched the history of Hitler from the beginning, from about 1928, when he became to take little power, and there's lots of story written in the papers and things like this. And we knew that this man is really a danger to society, not only in the Germany, but influence also every other country around him, like France, Czechoslovakia, uh, uh, Croatia, Yugoslavia, Hungary, Poland. But you was worrying that something can happen to you in Poland? I tell you strictly. You see, I was, remember, I was a teacher already in, in 1934 that I went to the army, to the officer school in 1935, and then I got my master degree in 1936. That I was more involved with the personal things in this particular time than thinking about the political aspect of what is going on. But then when I start to teach in a Jewish gymnasium, because this is what I started. What year was this? In 1936. You mm -hmm. see, in this time I realized that what is going, and we watched much more carefully what was going in Germany, particularly when in 1937, 1938, they start to expel German citizens born in Poland, and they were shifting them, uh, shipping them from all over uh, Europe, Czechoslovakia. For example, in 1938, my mother, my father accepted a family from uh, Moravia. The, the, uh, we, we kept the whole family till they decide to go out uh, because the Czechoslovakia has agreement with the with, uh, uh, Russia in 1938 that they can go through Russia and they were sent and permitted by Germans to go over there after I that. never I never heard that a Jew become uh, in a in an officer school in a Polish army uh, How this uh, I was the lucky one <laughs> How this happened You see I tell you what happened when I was on the university because when you became high school graduate you are uh, eligible to go to officer school every graduate uh, regardless of your religion or nationality or what it is, you are in Polish citizen, you have to go to the army. But you can get exempt when you start to study. So I got exempt f for five years because it takes about five years to graduate university and get the degree, you see. Uh, I finished in, th in three and a half years, put it this way. And I figured out what I, ha I want to go to that. I personally want to go to the army. I want to prove that we are not any different the Jews than any other Polish Catholic uh, boys. And they sent me to the most strictest, the most difficult uh, officer school to Bydgosz. Bydgosz was a non-city of Germans because Bydgosz was annexed to Germany till 1918. In 1919, they got the part of the Germany to Poland. Originally, it was always for century Polish ground. And in the Bydgosz was lots of German family who became Polish citizen. And in this particular officer school, and this was close to about 400 students in the officer, 90% were the Germans. We call them Wasser Polak. And you were the only Jew in the... I was the only one Jew in the officer school. And, and uh, I'll tell you something. There were certain requirements for the Jews. You are the best or you are out. When you are not the best, you're going to the army for two years. Or you want to finish in one year, you have to be best. I was very lucky. I, was, I, I finished with the highest rank from the officer school as a sergeant officer candidate. And three of us was there. You saw the picture, yeah, yeah. the two boys who are friends of mine and this who sent me the picture, we were the three top in the class. 
Tell me, and where you heard, and then you came back from the army? Yes. Home? You were teaching in the Jewish oh, school? Yes, I have a right away a job. From all over the Poland, the old Jewish private school was looking for a teacher of physical education. Also, I have a right to teach ROTC as an officer candidate, because I was nominated in 1938, full pledge officer. And I was the guy that was important. I have offered from every high school in Poland, but I stay first in Krakow. Where hit you the war? Where, where hit you the war? 1939. And I will tell you right now. In 1938, I got a wonderful job in a brand new Jewish high school in Częstochowa. Magnificent school with the best teachers what they money can buy, what they selected and they can only lure them there to the little town from city of Krakow or Warsaw or, or, or Vilna or anyone by giving them almost double salary. I was, <laughs> you must understand that in this time I was 24, uh, no, in this time I was 26 years old and I was getting close to 300 American US dollar a month. I don't think so anybody in America in 1937 or 38 got so much money. So you was in Chester Hall when so the I war came the out? I took the job and over there till the 1939, I was for the last two years, 38, 39, I was teaching there. And there was beautiful two years for me as a young man. Then I came back to Krakow when the war started. I was teaching in city of Krakow in the Hebrew gymnasium, one of the best and most prominent high school in Poland, Jewish high school in Poland. What you have done when the war came out? You when the war coming, I was, uh, I was, mobilization came to me with a secret telephone call because uh, I was uh, trained as a company commander, you see? And the same day in 19, and I was 1930, I got the order to go immediately to my unit, what was in Rzeszów which is about 100, uh, 200 kilometers away from Krakow, in eastern, toward east. And I arrived the Friday morning, about four o'clock in the morning. Six o'clock, the war started, and the first uh, planes was bombing, bombing all the uh, uh, barracks and the, the, the uh, regiment. In, our, in Rzeszów was bombed the first Friday night, and the third, of, uh, I became a second in command of the company because the professional captain, I was a lieutenant, captain was the officer in charge, I was his right hand, the second in command. When we went on the 6th, we have the first uh, attack by the German motorized army by the city of Sonsch, Dovi Sonsch. And this is what happened that our company commander was killed and I took over the company and we stayed for two days defending this particular you, South department. You actually shot the Germans at this time? You were shooting on the Germans? They were about 400 meters away and I was shooting and I was... I didn't say that my bullet any, to shoot anybody. One thing is I know that my company was completely uh, almost wiped up. 240 Soldiers I took out from under the fire about 45. That's all the rest or got killed or wounded or, or run away Who knows what happened? I was wounded a day after Second day. Yes. No, this was about seven seven of and then the, you went to a German then, hospital? No, 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 I was still uh, limping and still the our company was first towards the German in, in, invaders and when we start to retreat, the whole division, my company was the last one protecting the retreat. So we were going toward Lwów, toward east. And by the city of uh, on River San Przemysl, we dig in and we decide to st stand up against the German. And when we were sitting there, I remember like today, this was in, around this 20th or 22nd, of uh, September, two tanks come from the west side and about three tanks from the east side, the German tanks and the Russian tanks. And we start standing up, we are thinking the war will be over because the Russians are coming to help us. But then I saw a strange thing. There were a lit on the river, sun is a bridge 
the officer, German officer got out from the tank, Russian officer got out from his tank. They went on the bridge, they shook hands, they come back, and we knew that we were, we were double cross over there. And the German crossed the uh, river Sun and took Przemysl, and we were forced to retreat towards Lvov. But my orderly, 18 years old boy from city of Zeshov, from a village not far away from Zeshov, was very badly wounded in the arm. So I decided to take him back to the hospital in Przemysl. Even that I knew that the Przemysl will be in a few hours in the hands of Germany, but other way he would not survive. And I, and I brought him over there to the hospital. And the same night in the hospital, I met my friend who is a priest. Young fellow who was a priest was from childhood with each other. And he came to me, he said to me, Poldek, when this Wojciech Boydos is the name of the orderly, will not amputate his arm, he will not live in the morning. And he doesn't let us do it. The doctor can do nothing. I, as a priest, cannot do that. This boy, the orderly, was a Catholic boy. Maybe you can do something. So I limped to his bed, and I said, you have to let them do it, or the way you will die. Oh, no. I, as a farmer, I, without the hands, I have not worth anything. I said, look, you're losing the arm for your fighting for, for Poland. Poland will never forget you. When you give me order to amputate the arm, I will obey. I give him the order, the hand was amputated, the boy survived, and strange things. I got a, I have it here, a letter from a Polish nurse from Poland, that because they found out I put the ad in the paper that I looking for my orderly, that he lives someplace around the Zeshuv, that I should contact the competent organization of Poland, they will find him for me. I didn't have the time, but this came about a month ago, so I have still time to look at for him. Yeah. So he was one of the very rare Jews that was fighting the Germans? Well, there were lots of Jews fighting the Germans in Polish army, quite a bit. Soldiers and officers, there were other Jewish officers, uh, doctors and, and uh, uh, trained professional, even professional Jewish officers yeah. over there. And how the war finished for you? My life was completely changed because I was destined to do something else. But on account of the war, my whole education, my whole talent was wasted, put it in. I know, but I how the war it. finished? Uh, what's happened on the end of the war? And the, and the end of the war, I, I was taken prisoner of war because I was in the city of Przemysl and the German, because remember, we were under jurisdiction of the army, not Gestapo or SS. The army controller, they gave us a choice to the officer. They didn't ask whether I'm Jewish or not Jewish. That we can go to the prison of war to Russia because they were, Russians were taking back this part of the river Sun from Germany. So they gave a choice only to the officer, not to enlisted man, that we can go to prison of war to Russia or the prison of war to Germany. We were officially prison of war of German, but they give us a choice. Many of my colleagues, because we were thinking to go to east to Romania, cross Romania, go to Yugoslavia, from Yugoslavia, take the uh, ship to France, and the Polish army was organized in, in French in business this time. But I was thinking different way. I knew that Russia never signed the uh, Geneva Convention. And I didn't, I knew, mentality, what will happen, the Stalinist period, you understand, that I will probably wind out someplace in Siberia. This one was I was thinking. The Germany signed the, the Geneva Convention. I see they will obey the rules. This doesn't mean they will, but this was my thinking in this time. They I decide to go to German prison of war instead to Russian. And I found out later on, and I have the book to prove it, that the 16,000 Polish officer, and some of them the Jews were there, was killed in cotton and, and surrounding area. Uh, I escaped, the, the, the train was passing from the city of Krakow, and we have to change the train to different one. 
And when I was there, it's interesting how easy little story can change everything. <coughs> when we were there in the hospital, because I have a three and a half years medical study, the professor of anatomy from Warsaw University, Professor Lod, was the officer in charge of the hospital, because he was a doctor. And he needed assistance, and I was his assistant, and I was with the nurses and with the, all the doctor doing operation. A very serious, some of them. You understand? When I will talk about this, you wouldn't believe it, what we were doing there. You see? And... Uh, Pfefferberg. So we just arrived to Krakow and you... No, escaped. we are not in Krakow yet. You see, in the city of Przemysl, because I was assistant to the doctor who was the chief operating doctor, I was participating in all the operation, not only on the Polish soldiers, but also on the German soldier who was brought to the hospital. We received a piece of paper signed by the army with the German spread ego, you know, that we have a right to go outside the hospital to the field to pick up the wounded soldiers. And I kept this. You see, when we, when they decide to move out from city of Przemysl, the German, and give it to the Russian, so the river sun became the, the Kurzon line, you know, between Russia and Germany from 19... Uh, for uh, 39 till 19 later on till June 1947 uh, till 1941 you know they took us by train back to Germany and the train stopped in city of Krakow and we, they were holding us in the and I know the city where, where I was born I know the the station every inch of it they put us in the first class waiting room there were a couple hundred of the officers and we were waiting because they were changing the train to take us to Germany then I noticed a strange fellow staying on the rear door holding a guard a soldier not assessment no Gestapo soldier then I came to him because I, sp I spoke very well G German you know an educated language German not a slang and I asked him a simple question can you listen and he's the wall. So I took the piece of paper what I got it from the authorities in Przemysl and show it to him. Read it. He looking and then it is written there that I have a right to get out to to bring this. So he opened this door and he knew we are officer. Salute, goodbye. I went out six o'clock in the morning, I jumped on trolley car and my home was exactly about five minutes by trolley car from there. I came home about six fifteen I was home. Then I burned my officer uniform, except the preachers, but I dyed black so I could use them very, because I have a beautiful boots and were very good because it was October, November, December, and was good to have it because in this time all the Polish people was having high boots, you know, and I want to look pretty good like the general public. Who you find home? You was I, my mother was there, my father was there and my sister was there, the one closest. All my family was intact in this time. This was in uh, beginning of October 1939. And then uh, when? Then I found out three days later from the lady who was in sh supervisor of the apartment building when we lived. And they, she likes me very much because as a single man, I was sometimes coming after 10 o'clock when the door to the building was closed and you have to ring her up, give her a tip. I give her a 20, 30 zlotys or like five, six dollars a month and I have a key and she likes me always. I found her a gift or something. She called me and say, Paul, you have to hide. The Gestapo is looking for you. 
They were here and they asked me to report the minute you come over. So I start to hide different places every night. I never come back home. Sometimes I sneak home during the day to see my parents or my mother. My father was working in this particular time because they took all the businesses away uh, with Jewish Gemeinde as a, one of the uh, uh, workers there. Volunteer, not volunteer, they get paid a little bit, but not too much. He didn't make too much money. My, money was, my mother was the biggest supporter. And you, you're supposed to, to wear the Yeah, they, they, they came in, a, in, a, in a, about in October time with the order that every Jew over 13 years of age has to carry uh, the armband. No, I carry the armband when I consider it's important to carry. Mostly I keep it in the pocket or I didn't wear it when I was out. I your, have a, your grandfather, grandmother, they were... My grandfather then was not alive. My grandmother was alive from, uh, from my father's side. From my mother's side, both parents were dead already. But the family was intact. This means his brother and sister and the cousin and uncle, family close to about 100 members of the family was a tremendous, from both sides, was a tremendous family. So, so when uh, you was working on this time, something? Uh, I was working till the gymnasium was closed. This means till the 1st of January, 1940. Then they closed the, the school. So then you have to do something. So because I was very well known, between the Jewish circle as a teacher and my students, parents, some of them were very wealthy. When I, for example, I give you a small example. One of my students' father has the imports of the velour hats. In Poland, velour hats were expensive, like about $5 in this time, like 35 zloty or 40 zloty, what was quite a bit amount of money in this time. And Somebody wanted, I got a few of those velour hats from him and make a couple zloty or a few dollars. Then everything was permit, permittable, except you cannot uh, sell uh, cur a currency like dollars or German marks. The, this was, or, or English pound. This was a, a, not allowed by the law and was punishable by, by that for the Jew or for Polacks maybe to go and and uh, to jail for a few years, or maybe even to a concentration camp. Tell me, how you met your wife? How, how I make my life? No, no, your wife. I met my wife, this is a, she should t probably told you too, this was extraordinary story, because in this time I was living with my friends, not with my parents, I never. So you left and, your parents? Uh, yeah, and my friends still have the store, wholesale skin, raw skin, like, for shoes, for clothes, for handbags, you understand? So we were trying to unload it as much as possible of those skins so that we will not be confiscated by the Germans because they were confiscating it. Again, this way I was making certain amount of profit and making living, supporting my family. My father didn't make any money. My mother, mother still was interior decora decorator and still was making some money, but was very, very difficult because we were kicked up from this apartment, I think so, by the end of Docto October or beginning of September, we lost everything. When we received the apartment back, was completely empty walls, nothing in it, everything disappeared. So we lost almost everything in about, I would say, half an hour time. Now, what happened with my wife? This is a very interesting story. One day, they came an order that the Jewish family has to accept people, for, not only Jews, they were liquidating the intelligentsia of the city of Lodz. They took about 1,000 most prominent Jewish and non-Jewish and Gentile family out, confiscating everything in it. Doctors, attorney, professors and teachers. Mother of my, uh, my mother-in-law, mother of Mila, was a very prominent uh, doctor. She was skin and venerology doctor. And she was first on the list. Mila didn't have to go with her. But she was only in this time 18 years, 19 years old, you understand? So she didn't want to stay alone. And she went with mother and they sent her to the city of Krakow. Because in this time we were also working for, to have a document that we working 
you see. We were also involved in a work in the Jewish Judenrat. I was assistant to the president. What was my job? But I was keeping the appointment. I stay by the door. Everybody wants to see the president. And I was the man who was uh, responsible, who can go and talk to the president. My, uh, my friend, where I stay with him, was in charge in the welfare department there. So he had the order to go and pick up some family and assign some apartments for them. So he saw a young woman who was uh, introduced as a doctor, Maria Levinson, and a beautiful young lady around 19, 20 years old, you understand? He said, we will, we have, he has three apartments to his disposal. He decided to take this doctor Levinson and her daughter, Ludmila Levinson, to our apartments because we have a tremendous apartment. And it was Friday evening, about six o'clock in the evening, <laughs> I tell you something. They came up with a droshka, you know what is droshka? Horse and, and carriage, and was pouring. And I was waiting, I didn't know that he's bringing any company. And he said, Paul, I have a guest today and you have to run and buy anything the best you can buy. Ham, cheese, bread, liquor, anything you can put hands on it, go and bring it home because we have an important guest. And he introduced me to Dr. Levinson and to Ludmila, and he said, to, <laughs> I have to introduce you my best friend, Professor Leopold Felferman. <laughs> and I met my wife. And then you? I met this way my wife Friday night. And how long was uh, until you married? I tell you something very interesting. He said to me, Paul, I will marry this girl, so stay away, so I stay away. <laughs> But not long ago, later on in December, I kissed her and she said, you can have her. So I took it. And, and I married, married her. Uh, in the we, got in MJ, we got engaged on the uh, day when my sister got married. Yeah. That was in March. When I was, uh, in this time, I, my 27 years birthday. And she was not even 20. Uh, one week after we got married, she was 20 years of age. And you were married in a, in a, in a synagogue? Or? Yeah, we were married in a private synagogue. The synagogue was closed in a private thing. And I came about 45 minutes later. I still was not <laughs> sure or I was doing the right thing. But we got married and then we went home. And when we were using the trolley car, it was some young punks, you know, over there, the uh, uh, Nazis. And they kick us out and said, this, this Yiddish Scheisse rouse. What that means? Uh, the Jewish shit get out from here. So in this time, it was very difficult already to live in Krakow, right? No, still was quite uh, pleasant. And I was making pretty good money because I met Schindler, Oscar Schindler, who later on I found out that he is a very decent human being who was interpreter. And uh, he came to my mother, recommended by a Jew, for my mother to redecorate the apartment for the Jewish fellow, and he purchased from the Jewish fellow. He paid him 50,000 zloty, but was quite a bit amount of money in this time, maybe five, six thousand uh, dollars. And this uh, uh, Oscar Schindler came over and was recommended. My mother hesitated, and it's interesting, you know, I still have my pistol. You know, when I, when I was dressing up, this was not the real military revolver. This I lost over there is buried in the ground in Przemysl, over there in the hospital someplace. I, I dig it in the ground. My little one dressy, you know, when I was dating a girl and I went in the uniform, I put the pistol to impress her a little bit more. <laughs> That's all what was the fun for it. And uh, when I saw, when somebody was knocking on the door, and I was alone with my mother, and I, my mother looked through the looker, you know, in the door, you know, view, the viewer, and she said, Paul, this Gestapo. He, she saw through this door looker a guy with a big swastika, swastika. And he, she was thinking, it's Gestapo. So I have the pistol put behind my belt and figured out that probably I have to fight that stupid thinking, you know. But this way you think when you are young, you know. And you still didn't know that what kind of uh, problems you can have it. 
And I said to her, let's come in. And I hide behind the door and listen to the conversation. And from his tone of voice and his way how he was talking to my mother, I realized the man is some different type of guys and I stepped forward. And he's taller, he was taller than I, but I consider I was pretty handsome and he was extremely handsome man. I look at his eye, he looks in my eyes and what happened? Some thread of sympathy, some understanding between the German uh, Catholic and the Jewish Polish officer started. I was always dressed very well. So after when he was talking with my mother, I explained her what he wanted from her, and she still hesitated. She was afraid. So I told my mother, how can I go ahead and do it with him, the business, because we, we need the money. And he said, you know, I see you have a wonderful shirt, pure silk shirt, and I need something like this. So I said to him, in German, everything is going German. Do you know how much cost this? You know, I got fresh. Do you know how much cost this type of shirt? He said, I don't care how much cost this shirt. I would like to have a dozen. I said, it will cost you $5 a piece, equivalent in Zloty, you know. He took the money and he gave me the money and said, take the measurement, get me this. And this way they start the friendship between Oskar Schindler and Leopold Pfefferberg, what lasted the day he died in 1974 in October. The Tell 9th. me, and then when they opened the crack, when, when was the Krakow gate open? What's happened with you then? Now the, we were living in this Krakow till, in the city of Krakow till the end of 1940. Then the rumors came in that they will having a close uh, part of city only for Jews to keep them under the supervision and protected them from the Polish population. This is the reason they want to consolidate them in one part of city, in city of Kraków, down in Podgorze. This is a suburb. I personally didn't like the idea, but we said, like, let's try to get the permission to, to do this. So, we apply. Coincidentally, the, my family was not protected by the Jewish Federation because they were not essential worker over there, and we didn't get it. And we have to move from this city to any place we want east from Krakow. So because my brother-in-law, husband of my uh, sister Pauline, was from Sanok, they decide to go to Sanok, and I decide with Mila to go to Sanok too. But then I got a bright idea. Why should I move from Krakow? I was born here, I didn't do anything wrong. I will go to the city hall and ask them for the permission to stay in Krakow. So I went dressed beautifully with a Jewish armband, and I went there and asked for the mayor of the city, Mr. Pablo. They said, Mr. Pablo is not here. But his assistant is here. I said, I don't care, I will talk to his assistant. And what they bring me to a, uh, to a beautiful office, and behind the desk is an SS officer sitting, handsome guy, and I couldn't believe it my eye. There was a friend of mine who was from Vienna, who was instructor of Polish national ski, uh, ski team in 1939. In February was first Federation International Ski uh, exercises in, Krak in Zakopane in the mountains, winter uh, uh, type of Olympics game. And he was the instructor of Polish uh, group. And they need somebody who is also instructor who speaks German. And the Polish National uh, organiz uh, Ski Organization selected me. And I met, we became a very good friend. He was coming to my home. We were going dancing. I introduced him to some lovely Jewish girls, you know, and everything went. When I look at his, I said, I couldn't believe it. And he couldn't believe it. And he said to me, Paul, what Max do here? What are you doing here? I said, I didn't get any permission to stay. You know, I'm Jewish. He didn't know that I am Jewish in this time because I spoke German, but I uh, look like another nice Polish fellow, you know, and you did you something did you something wrong? I said no, I didn't do anything wrong. 
I was the officer in Polish army and I fight for Poland. And you are officer in the German army. You were fighting for my, for German, Germany. When this is a crime, this is the only crime I committed. So what you will, would like me to do? I said I would like to have permission for my, for me, my wife and my family to stay here in Krakow and go to the ghetto. We did, they didn't call it the ghetto. They called this only a special section for protection of the Jewish population of city of Krakow against the Polish people. He said, okay, I will try to do it. I let you know when you have to leave. I said, Sunday afternoon, we're leaving. And this moment, I went home and I said to my family, we have a chance to stay. We Friday, uh, Sunday, we went over there to the assembly place for which we were going to the city of Sarnok. I didn't see this. Mr. Bre let me, can you can you give me this? Thank you. You know? Yes, and then? And I didn't see anybody. This guy didn't show the sep really doesn't showing up. But about three o'clock afternoon somebody is yelling, Pfefferberg, Poldi Pfefferberg. So I came over and said, You you and your wife, you can get out, go back to your apartment. But your parents I couldn't arrange it. It was the last time I saw my parents, and my sister, my brother, and my mother and father. Mila and I will stay home till March the, uh, 1941, when they decide to move all the Jewish population from the city to the ghetto. So we took a little bit of our things because the furniture was impossible to, expensive furniture, expensive furniture. Mother paid about, before the war in Vienna, order about $3,000 for the furniture, what was magnificent. What? What's and we went to ghetto, and we stay in ghetto from March the, the from my birthday, March the 20th, till, till March the 20th, 1943. What's happened with your family? You went to San? Your mother, father, and sister, they went to... They went to Sanok, they stay in Sanok. But I got the information after that my sister, my brother-in-law, his brother and his wife went on the false paper. They got themselves uh, false paper. I advised them to go across the river Sun because Sanok is on the river Sun, to cross the river Sun and get to, to Lvov and to go to Russia. But I found out later on in the and this was in 1942 that my brother-in-law and my sister and his brother and his wife are in Częstochowa and they are blackmailed. And they need few thousand zlotys. So I sent them the few thousand zlotys. That was the last time I heard from them. Then after the war, I found out that they were caught by coincidence. His brother with his wife survived and they coincidentally got in the trap. You know, they and got an apartment in Warsaw and this apartment was under surveillance. And your mother and father? They were in the city of Sanok and they lost their life when the city of Sanok was liquidated. Probably they were, they were sent to Grodno camp or to Belzec, you know. I don't know where they were. Tell me, Polak, and then you... My sister was arrested with my brother-in-law in Warsaw in 1943 and they were executed in the forest of Palmyre, about uh, 20 kilometer from Warsaw. I went there, I have some photos from the Jewish tombs and Catholic crosses, but no names, that, so I am not sure where they really were buried. When you came to, to the ghetto with Mila, yes. now, in 1941, yeah. from 1941 to 1943, two years, what was what happened in the ghetto? How you lived in, in the ghetto? What you, you were see, doing? I, 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 I was very. How I will tell you how, the, you know, when you have a connection. And remember, as a teacher, I have lots of people, uh, I knew, and I was respected, you know, by by the parents. When somebody has any chance to influence, like he can give me in Jewish, Gemeinde, what was run by the Jewish Gemeinde. Permission to get out. So I got the permission. Maybe cost me few few slots that I could go outside. Going outside, I was riding on the bicycle, always on the bicycle, because that was my like a shield and protection. Because normally the Jew couldn't ride the, the trolley car. They couldn't use the droshka. He couldn't. He could only walk and have the armband. 
The minute I was outside the ghetto, the armband went sticking out someplace, and I was riding on the bicycle, and I have a lot of Polish friends, tremendous amount of friends from the university, from the army, from the school, and, and they were very supporting, very supporting. And everything, I need something. So I was smuggling some things, like, for example, uh, uh, somebody need a, a strawberry uh, jam or, or, or uh, juice to make wine. It was a winery in ghetto. Because sugar, they couldn't get it. So I broke, brought him about 50 bottles of it. Because I knew somebody who was on the guard with the things and with few dollars, you could bring them in. You make a living. Huh? I was always traveling with a big bag, and in the bag you could find anything you wanted. So that, that was very dangerous. Oh, when I, when I will be caught, I wouldn't be talking to you. I didn't think about the danger in this time. I was thinking that I am so smart that I can avoid everything. But uh, you never know what you He was sure that you will survive this ghetto? I'm sorry? You were sure you will survive the ghetto? Oh, I was sure that I will survive the ghetto, there's no question about it. But and you, I will survive the war too. You saw that the people disappearing from the ghetto. Do, to, to start to I, think, you I'll know? tell you something, what was. I have a chance to go out any time, no problem. But Mila was a little bit scared. Remember, she was only 20, 21 years old. She never lived yet. She didn't saw the world, nothing. I was a, at least seven years old, and, and I saw something in my life already. You but what I mean? but you, you saw the people disappearing. You know that they, they are killed. They were, I know they were going on the false paper. I knew they were going to the border, to Czechoslovakia, to Hungary. I knew everything. But remember, Mila got a one big complex. She was thinking that she looks too Jewish to go out. And I to try to persuade her that she doesn't look Jewish. She looks like a French girl, like an Italian girl, like a Romanian girl. And she has a birth certificate that she's born in Romania because she was born in Romania. When she was not no, even... I'm not, yeah, I know, but I'm not asking this. I'm asking, you did know in this time about the Jews are killed in the oh, we knew Treblinka, it. I, 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 tell, I tell you what, what it is. In 19, my uncle was a big shot in Jewish Gemeinde. He was arrested with the president of the Gemeinde because they were bribing a German official to allow the Jews to stay in Krakow, not to get together. What this is guy, Gemeinde? Gemeinde. There's a Jewish uh, uh, federation, you know, Jew, Jewish council. So. They arrested three people. One of them was the president, who the president was a teacher before the war. He was my teacher. When I became a teacher, I was teaching in the same high school what he was teaching, we were colleagues. This reason I was uh, selected by him to be, uh, and give me the, the documentation that I work in the Jewish council. My uncle was a uh, uh, treasurer, and they tried to bribe a higher official to allow the Jews to stay as long as possible in their homes. And they were sending them every day to work, the forced labor, because every day they assign lots of people to work. Now, when, for example, when I supposed to go this day to work, I took a, a 10 zloty or 20 zloty, I give a guy and he took my card, he went for me there. You understand? So I didn't have to go. <coughs> you could buy your time. And this way I have a chance to go and make some... Somebody has a diamond ring. A jeweler. He couldn't go out. He was like, out. Oh. He gave me the diamond ring. I went outside. I sell it. I give him the amount he wanted. And the difference I kept as a commission. And this way I was making a living. But I'm asking, you heard about the, the Jews are killed this time around I will tell Poland? you. I tell you what happened. We knew that the Jews are rounded up and sent to the different places, Suppo supposed to go to a labor camps. Still, we never dream that any murder will be committed in this particular time. Nobody dreamed in 1940, 1939, 1940, or 41 even. But when you, when you first time, the first time I found out that my uncle was, was arrested in 1940 for the supposed to bribing this uh, official 
who denunciated him, he was sent to Auschwitz. And we were getting a note, till one day came a little box with ashes and a note that my uncle Joachim Goldfluss died from lung and from the inflammation of the lung. That was in 41? That was in 41. In this time, we already were getting information. For example, two and a half Polish officers who report themselves because the order came in that all reserve officer or any officer uh, who is civilian now has to report themselves to Gestapo. I didn't go because Gestapo was looking for me, so I didn't register myself. But a few of my friends, Polish friends, who were also officers, registered, and I told them not to do We just stopped that the guy, Buchner, he came from Treblinka, he escaped, he came back, he was, his hair was completely white. And he started to talk to us about what he saw with his own eyes. Nobody believed him, particularly people who were in charge in the Jewish council. They were thinking that he got crazy. Impossible, or something like that. When I heard him, I realized that he is telling the truth because there was no reason for this man, who was extremely intelligent person, educated, to make a story like this up. And we found out one thing, that remember that the ghetto, when we came in 1941 in March, they start to make a selection right away, starting in June and repeat quite often every few months, because supposed to be only 15,000 people who supposed to be important for the uh, uh, industry, for armament, you understand? And the rest, old and children, supposed to go out. But they didn't want to break right away the families of when somebody was working for a German establishment, the family and him came over. But they never allowed them to take anything except five kilo from their home from outside. So the, they make the people completely paupers. They didn't have enough to eat, and the ghetto was starving, and people had to make a living. They were do it, trying to smuggle. Sometimes the people got caught. Sometimes they were making razzia in ghetto, because this ghetto from 15,000 grew up. People were sneaking in who didn't have permission to stay. So they were making selection, and those people were sent someplace, supposed to be to the labor camps as a penalty. But they were send, they're sending them to Treblinka or Belzec or, or to Helm or to other places when they were killing them the minute they arrived there. There were single people survived like the Mr. Buchner one. But he was, he was working for the consul. Uh, there was some uh, ghetto, polit uh, ghetto police units. He was working on one of these? Yes, I was there from exactly when the Jewish consul transferred to ghetto and I was working in a Jewish Council as an assistant, the president, before he was arrested, because he was arrested a few months later, he asked to join it because they needed the police. In this time, I figured out this is an obligation and there's a moral duty to protect the Jewish community in ghetto, particularly the Germans. Was, we were not under jurisdiction of Gestapo in this time, only under your jurisdiction under uh, uh, Schupo. There's two different branches. Schutzpolizei. Schutzpolizei, you see? And they said, you will protect the people from the outside world who would like to come over or steal something or something. And I was there from March, the, the maybe 15 or, or so, because I was still working as an assistant to the president, and you have to join it. And there were about 40 of those uh, uh, policemen, so-called. You, you had some uniform? 
They have, we have the uniform, sure. Can you the describe uniform. what kind of uniform? The, uh, coincidentally, I was using my black pants, the officer pants, because I dyed them black and, and I have uh, uh, boots, you see? And we have a jacket, uh, regular like this, uh, close with the buttons here, and we have the armband here, the Ordnungdienst. But strange things, a couple months later, yes. and I had a special hat, similar what we saw in the movie. Yeah. It's exactly, this exactly what I was dressed. Some, not everybody has the same uniform. Sometimes they have their own clothes only with the armband. But uh, because it was beginning, and the duty was, for example, that we patrolled the street and, and the perimeter of the ghetto. Later on, they built the walls, so it was very easy only they stay on the guard on the, on the gate. But in about in April, about two months later. April which year? 1941. The, when they closed the ghetto, we, they got information, the Jewish council, that from jurisdiction of Shupo, the jurisdiction is coming to the Department 5 of Gestapo, this is political department, when Jewish department. Then I said to Mila, po, Mila, this is not anymore job for me. But you cannot quit. You cannot say, I, I don't want to be. So I went to a brother, to the president, Dr. Bieberstein, Mark Bieberstein was the president. Dr. Alexander Bieberstein was a family doctor of ours from before the war. I went to him, and he was a doctor appointed by the uh, Jewish council to be a doctor for the Ode, the Ordnungdienst. I went to him and said, look, I have to quit. You are not sick. I said, no. You have to find something that I should quit. I don't want to be in the police. I don't want it. I don't like to be under jurisdiction. Gestapo, particularly that Gestapo was looking for me when I escaped from the prisoner of, of war. They get my name and bingo. They, they have me. Uh, we, can you pr pretend that you have a bad back? Oh, I can pretend because I got a bad back before uh, from an accident that I have. I can pretend. And he taught me how to react to certain movement, you understand? So I report, uh, instead of duty, I report as a, I am sick. So they cannot put me in the work. So I was working with a cane and limping, you understand? But and you... they still didn't want to release me. I asked them to be kicked out. Now you have to go to a German doctor. And German doctor can release you. No, so I talk again with Dr. Bieberstein. He said, he told me, when he will put your hands, uh, leg up straight, jump. It's hurting. When he will bend the knee and push it in, you don't hurt nothing. When I was there, the doctor examined what he could find out, or his inflammation, or nothing, he couldn't find it. So he started moving my legs. So every time his stretched legs was lifted up, I yell. Every time the leg was bent, and he, yeah. So he wrote me a letter that I have a serious inflammation of the uh, uh, leg nerves and has to be released from the duty. What happened? Four months later, I was on the list to Auschwitz. And who saved me? I was in the evening, 10 o'clock at night, going to bed when two of them, and one of them was a student of mine, came in and said, Paul, run. You are on the list to be sent to Auschwitz. Hide any place you wanted, and we report we didn't see, found you. So I went to another apartment. There were lots of apartments with my friends in the ghetto, but you didn't have to go on the street to get to this apartment because we make a holes between the walls from one building to another, and we can travel all, all over the ghetto without even going on the street. And I stayed with them for a few years, and everything cooled off. Where was Mila? Mila was home. She was with you, with this Yeah, friends. she. Ha we have a little room, kitchen, one only kitchen. You see, we got in the in the building and Josefinska two on this second floor. And uh, you never. And then every then I then I found a job. I went to the uh, German Arbeits 
uh, assign a work assigning place, you know, when was a Colonel Sheptasi, Hungarian German, who was wonderful. He was executed later on for helping the Jews by the SS in 1943, end of 43, for helping Jews. And he looks on my ID card and see, in the ID card was written, Lop Magister Leopold Pfefferberg, Gymnasialer, high school teacher. He looks and he said to me, that's his kind beruf. This is not an occupation. Gymnasial professor. We don't need any gymnasial professor. So I said, but I am a good mechanic. This is a good profession. He raised this and put Schleifer, a mechanic, polisher. And you this. never heard about uh, in this time about Schindler anymore? Oh, yes. I was still every time I could get out, I was in the Schindler's or in a factory or in his home till almost to the ghetto was closed. How happened that you never went to the factory? Oh, he asked me many times. I always was dreaming that I have to get out. How long I was with Mila, you understand? I was in because I have to protect her. But I figured out when anything happened that we will be separated, I get out and I could a thousand times get out. No problem for me to get out from the ghetto. The day when it was ghetto liquidated, I was trying to get out, but then I found out when the place when I was hiding, where was a very good place, the dogs that were going with Amun get through the street will smell me out because they smelled about two, three hundred meters away a woman with child and they killed them. Then I stepped out from behind and I pretend that I didn't see them and I start to move the bundles where people left and they were sent to the Plashov already, or to Auschwitz, or because uh, they separate the one to go to Plashov and the one to go to the to Auschwitz, you know. And when they came up close to me, I still have my boots and my breeches. I click report to him military way that I got the order from another officer to clean the road, and they start to laugh him because it was a stupid order. But he was an officer. And I have a wonderful article that written by American uh, Major, Air Force Major, what means salute in this respect to the superior, and superior will obey what you have to say to him. And the plot was working very good because I knew, besides I was watching him too, what he's doing. When he will go for a gun, probably I will go for his throat. I don't know, it's nothing to lose anymore. But I was watching him, they were laughing, he hit me with the right part and said, Verschwind, this means get lost. I salute again, click my heels, turn it, and slowly I was going away till the next corner. And then I ran when he couldn't see. Where, 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 when where, I will be running, he will shoot me. Where Mila? Where she Mila was already. What happened? We make arrangement with Dr. Alexandrovich, a dear friend of mine, MD doctor, that he, his wife, and his child, Mila and I, will go with the sewers out because he already made arrangement with the friends to accept us you see but he went earlier because the uh, the the segregation start in his area sooner than in our in the you know they did section by section so he went to the sewers and he was one of the few who really got out early in the morning from the sewers and they disappear in the city when I came in to look for them, I was thinking that they're still there. And I left Mila in the apartment. She was very scared, because, and I was scared, everybody was scared in this time. You know, when I come back, when I found out that they already went to sewers, and already were killing people in the sewers, you see? So I went for Mila, I came over, there's no Mila there anymore. So I started looking in the hospital, because there were about 60, 70 body laying there or maybe she, she got killed or something, then somebody told me that he, they saw Mila going with a group of Madrid because she was working for Madrid to Plashov. Then I decided to hide because I figured out when I get out, I can be much more of help for her than being inside with her. But I couldn't do it. I was lucky I came out with life. I was one of the last one the group was maybe about 25, 30 people who were supposed to clean something. And after when this group left, ghetto was sealed, close to 7,000 people was killed over there. Uh, 
uh, when you saw all this killing around you and all these people, do you believe in God, in the religion, that God will save you? Uh, this is a very difficult question to answer. You believing in God, this is pray and say I'll hide. I believe it more in destiny. I believe it that you create your own destiny, you see? And I was looking always for a way to get out, not to stay in. I am not a follower. I am a type of a leader. I never follow. I try to be, when somebody lead me, I think so I'm as good as him or maybe better. So I always try to be the leader. You see, in any place, any time, and I select my work the way I think is proper for me in case of emergency. Like I was working in the garage. How I got to garage? I saw a guy with the black glasses in get in plush of working, and I asked the people what the guy is doing. He's a welder, and he can walk around the camp, and nobody bother him now because maybe he has a job. This is for me. When they were asking me, they saw me my can cut that I am mechanic. What is it? What specialty? I'm a welder. I never welded in my life. They sent me to this guy and the Gestapo officer from the camp brought me in and said to this guy, there was Mr. Mandel, who became a good friend of mine, you know, after when we met, who was a real welder, a professional for many, many years. He was much older than I. He said, this guy is a welder and I know you need a helper. Try him out. I'm going for lunch. I'm coming back in about half an hour, 45 minutes. And the, he left and he looked at me, show me your hands. I showed him my hand. You are not a welder. I said, who told you I'm a welder? I told him I'm a welder, not to you. I am a, and he knew about me a little bit that I was a professor. I was a teacher. I have, I said, how I can teach you welding? You show me how you start and what you're doing. And you, I try it. I got a little touch of it. When the guy came in, I said, how he is? He said, oh yes, he's good, but he need little practice. And then the guy asked me uh, about the welding. I said, I tell you something. The temperature is 1,200, the hottest uh, point. The order is about 750 Celsius. When you melt it, you have to watch it to melt it the proper way. He didn't ask me to weld it. And how long he was working, working in the garage? I was working till the, almost to the end to liquidation of the, of the, of the um, camp. And you but in between, I was lucky again. They need a welder to weld the the cool house. This means the 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 no, refrigerator. Refrigerator. Refrigeration. So two of us they pick up, and we, we will be the welders, and we will be supervise all the pipes and everything because always something to be. Uh, so for a few months we were there, and this was a part of the uh, refrigeration for German officers. They have that sausages and butter and cheese. But you find Mila in the camp. Oh, yes, we were every day we saw each other. She was in the women's barrack when she came from work. I see her uh, sometimes on the upper plaza. I saw her. I, I could go to their barrack. She came come to, to our barrack. Sunday we could see when we don't work. So we, the living condition for you wasn't so bad in Plaza. I wouldn't say they were good. They were maybe I would say you can tolerate, tolerate this condition. You have a chance that you have your wife or your mother or your sister or someone to talk with them. Later on, they separate. They put a separate uh, wire, electric wire, between the women, and they, but took time, you know, to build it. The Jews were building this. But you the, heard that uh, they they killing a lot of people around, on the around around Plashov. You wasn't afraid that they will kill you. May I tell you something? I didn't think about this. I didn't. Never. Is this a secret to survive, not to think about? It is a secret. You see, you cannot be a cowardish, not a coward, only that you have to put the head in your sand. I consider myself, because I was welder, so I could go any place. I put uh, welding, uh, some, some uh, part of the welding machine or something, or took some tools, put my glasses on the head, and I was going, oh, something is wrong there in this barrack. And I was looking around the way how eventually in emergency is the way to escape from there. You see? You met, but it was not escape. It was very you difficult. You met uh, Amon Goethe some, some... Almost on a daily basis. Because we were working in his garage. We got three times whipped. First time we got 15 on the back. 
Why? Because one screw in his car fell out and he was afraid that this is sabotage. The second time something else happened and we got 25. The first time I fake it out, I put a piece of rubber on my bag and they didn't ask us to put the pens down. The second time they asked us to put the pens down, you see? And the third one, they came on Sunday and they killed a dear friend of mine, his sister-in-law, who was cleaning the cars. He was assigned to clean the car. Some reason, Amon Get came over and didn't like it. And they call all of us. And he asked the Ivan, his chauffeur, Ukrainian fellow, to kill the girl. And he, in our prison, he killed the girl. And then we got another 15 on the back. But there were a lot of selections in the camp. There were lots of selections, but, but garage, there was about 15 or 14 of us there, was like a special group, untouchable, because we, they were a very good mechanic, and we have about half a dozen cars to service. In this time, there was a lot of killing on Hoyava Gorka. Oh, you uh, heard about we, this? Well, we did. We cut out from the roof of our uh, garage a little part in the roof, just that we lifted the flap and we could see just on the level of the Huyova Gorka on the hill when they were shooting. I have the photos, some of those. And? Yeah, you know, and we were watching. Like one day I, I saw the German officer was executed there. We didn't know who. I, I, I think so that was the, the Bosco, the guy who was on the, wonderful human being because when I need something to go in the ghetto or get out he was on, in the guardhouse he gave me a pass you see so you was thinking you will survive the, the I always the, was thinking I will survive yeah, in plush or definitely oh, positively what the, but the, the most important things happened in 1944 in May they came a group of gypsy women from Hungary but were on their way to Auschwitz, but Auschwitz didn't have a place ready for them, so they hold them in Plaszow. And with friend of mine, who is a doctor, Rosli, and this time he was doctor, he was not even doctor, was a medical student, Rosenberg from City of Lodz, a friend of Mila, a story unusual with him. Unusual, the, almost similar what I did, the similar plot, he saw me walking with the, with the uh, glasses. He said that he's welder, and they brought him in. And we said he is a good welder. And but later on, he transferred to the medical group, and he was assistant in the medical uh, barracks there. We were walking Sunday, and we got a just piece of bread, maybe this size. You know, you were there, you see. And we were going and talking. We should eat right now the whole piece, or maybe leave it a little bit for later. And we were walking and we see the gypsy woman yelling to us. So we approached the, the wire separating the woman to, of us and try to find out what they want. And they, little bit German, little bit Hungarian, you know, Kichi Kenyar, Kichi Kenyar. We didn't know what mean Kichi Kenyar. Kichi Kenyar, give me a piece of bread, a bread, a brot in German. You see? So I brought a piece of bread and I give it this woman. She doesn't want to take it. So I asked her, why well, you're not taking it? Gypsy don't take. Gypsy will tell you something, what is your future. So I said, fine. You want a piece of bread? Tell me the future. She took my hand and looked at that and said, you and the close person to you will survive the war, will go over big water, and will live happy after. Wonderful. I said, what happened to you tomorrow probably will happen to me after tomorrow. Tell me. Then the, my friend gave the other gypsy a piece of bread and she asked him to tell him. And she is telling him a word, a word the same what she, they told me that we were laughing. Is it funny? The same proposition that they survived. He survived with his father. I survived with, my, with Mila, we went over big water, he's in Australia, I am in the United States, and we live happy after. Tell me, Polek, your family, I don't know if I ask you, was religious? Yeah, my father was conservative. Right? Yeah, you told my me. My grandparents were, were orthodox. Yeah, but you was, you, in the, in the camp, I'm coming in back to camp, my question. In the camp, we didn't think about this 
things of brain, even that uh, maybe subconsciously, as as a child, every time night when I went to bed, I said, dear God, keep my parents and my family healthy. And then I fell asleep from a little kid. How and I always was in the camp, too? In the camp too, even today too. <laughs> so now we're coming to the to you heard that the camp will be liquidated, you told me. No, the plasma was liquidated and uh, we knew that Schindler is preparing to move his factory. How you knew? Because there was, uh, 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 there was a lot of talking about it. Everybody wants to get on the list. I figured out I have no access now to the... Even that Schindler many times was asking, I won't get for Werder, for Werder to take me out there. But Amon always said to him, when somebody works for me, cannot work for you. And I was there. And I was figuring that the garage is protected. And when the garage is protected, then I will be here till the end. And when the Russian coming, we knew the Russian are already 100 kilometers away and they start to liquidate it, that some way, sometimes in the, come, in the right moment, I will get out from there. And Mila was very lucky because she was already in, in the transport in Stutkov. And one SS man, whom I broke his spirit, pulled her out. I don't know, Mila told you about this. You see? And he came over and almost killed me. And I stood, at, stood up to him. And he became a friend, and he was giving me always a piece of bread or apple or something for Mila. You see? And we were still together. This was in October 1944. Then Mila said, Paul, get us on the list to Schindler. He's your friend. He did so much for you and for, for the family. Maybe we'll put us on the list. So I went to the SS man whom I broke, Hans Schreiber, and I asked him to give my name and Mila's name to Mr. Schindler. But Oscar Schindler and his own already put our name on the list. And we found out ourselves on the way to Brinlitz, uh, to the fa new But you, you didn't went directly to Brinlitz, right? We went to Brinlitz, but not directly. Yeah. We, the, the men and women were separated. 900 men went through Gross Rosen, and they stopped over there. We were stopped over there. And we were sure that we will never will see uh, Oscar Schindler again. But about one week we spent there, and one day they give us a half bread, half of loaf of bread to every one of us. And by list, they put us on the train to bring us to How see. was the condition in Gross Rosen? In Gross Rosen, horrible condition. For the whole week, first of all, we didn't work. When we were, we, there were no condition to sleep because in the barrack was about 900 people sleeping in the whole barrack. We didn't sleep. We were sitting between the legs, one after another, like in a, Raw, and we couldn't sleep. But they changed your outfit, uh, your, your. Oh outfit. yeah, they took everything, and we got the striped uh, uniforms. And you get some numbers? Yeah, my number is nine zero six nine zero six. That is branded in my mind. Is nine nine zero six six nine zero six six ninety nine zero six six nine zero six zero six. You see, I, it's easier for me to say from memory right away the German because didn't, the way we report. You didn't get it on the, on the... No, they never number us. This was strange too, because we we were not supposed to stay al there, and when we will stay, we will be not supposed to be alive, you see? So they didn't have to give us the number. The number people were getting in Auschwitz, in Grossrosen, in Mauthausen and Dachau, only when they were considered that they will last for a few months and do the slave labor. You so see? then, when you when you get the then bread, then when we found out that we leaving Gross Rosen, but was a dead camp, you understand what I mean? We start to breathe now. Where we can send us probably to Schindler, to Brinlitz, because there's no sense to throw us from the Gross Rosen to another camp. So we knew we were going to Schindler, and um, about 24 hours later or two days later, I don't remember the amount of time, but passed by, we found ourselves over there in Schindler's camp, with the food waiting for us, with the place we slept on the floor, because we have to build our uh, uh, wooden bed, what we did, did it ourselves. But we were with him, so we were not afraid anymore. And he told us, 
I don't, we start to ask him, where is, um, uh, he knows Mila, he knows me, my family, we, he knows Ichusten, Moshe Beisky, and all those people who work with him, you know. We always be close to him and ask him, her director, where are the women? I don't know till one day, maybe four or five days later, he said, I just found out that they are in Auschwitz and I will try everything to get them out. He sent a beautiful German woman with lots of gifts and lots of money to, to uh, the, the officer Hess, you know, the SS officer in charge, to talk with him. Some things happened between him and her and, it, and the gifts and the sausages and liquor and vodka what Schindler sent to him with the note that he will be coming himself to pick up the women. And he came. They, I don't know the women knew that he was there, but we knew that he went there. And a few days later he came in. The women are coming. And six o'clock in November, beginning of November, the gate opened of the factory, six o'clock, and there was foggy day. Now we stay on the balcony because the uh, uh, place, uh, uh, our barracks were upstairs and the factory was downstairs in the building, the front building. And the factory was a tremendous factory. And like a shadow, you know, in the fog, the women were coming. I couldn't recognize my wife. But she said to me later on that she saw me over there on the balcony. And then they came in, they got uh, hot food, and I built it because I was again well there. I could go any place I wanted. So I started to bring, in, they were window to the latrine, but you couldn't open the window to the latrine because it was against the law. And the latrine was for the women and the other latrine was for men. So what I did, I put a tremendous amount of iron, steel, uh, uh, metal plates, everything possible to make a enter to the window and we knock out the window and the, we were talking, we were, they were sitting on the, in the latrine, we were talking with that wife. Later on we have a chance to talk with them uh, on the balconies because they were... So, so when you were... The period in Brinlis from November 1944 till May 8th at the night, 12 o'clock at night, 1945, was extremely interesting part of our life and our history over there. We felt, everybody of us, that how long Schindler is with us, will nothing happen to us. The minute he was not absent, we were very uneasy. Until, at a point, I give you a situation what him came in in the first weeks in January 1945. Two cattle train with about 136 people from Goleschau, this means subcamp, subcamp of Auschwitz, came. They were six nights, seven days, locked up without the food, without opening the gate, and every camp refused to accept them. They came early morning on Sunday to the Brinlitz, and Schindler was not there. Mrs. Schindler, who deserved a tremendous credit for saving the lives of those people, demanded that the cattle train should be open and the people should be taken out because factory need much more worker because we're producing extremely important sh artillery shell for the army and we have to deliver this. He never produced anything. Everything was faked 
and anything he needed to deliver, he was buying on the black market, Mr. Schindler, from another manufacturer who were making the same shell. Our shell was so bad that the ones we delivered, we, they start investigating why they are so bad. But Schindler was not there. And the Leipold, the uh, Oberscharfuhrer, Oberstumpfuhrer, Leipold, who was in charge of the SS, about 40 of them, but they were elderly. The young already, they were sent to the front. They were like in 40s and 50s. Uh, didn't want to keep this, and he want to send it back to some other camp. She told him, when you will not let these people out till Mr. Schindler will come over, we need the people. You will go to Eastern Front. You know that Mr. Schindler has a connection in Berlin. Don't, don't interfere. He let her wait till Schindler come in, and Schindler come in and call the world as Mr. Mandel and me. There were two of them, to come over because you couldn't open the door. You have to melt the snow and you have to cut the hinges. We cut the hinges and we took the door. From this 136, 16 was dead. And the rest, another five hours, four hours, two hours, they all will be dead. They were frozen. They were, some of those lost ears, part ears, toes, part of nose. Some way, somehow, Mrs. Schindler and Oscar Schindler put upon themselves to play angels. And they do everything possible to save those people's life. They never work. He has to pay six and a half mark for each of us. So even for those people who didn't work, and he pay for them. He, she found medication that was necessary on the black market in Tsuitao in Sudetenland. And they saved this life of about 100, 15, 120. No, 16 was dead. So, and there's a couple more die later on. But over 100 Goleshaw people survived, and they survived the war, and they brought to life. And the most dramatic item was this, that they, he got the order to burn the body in the oven over there in the factory, Heizung over, the big oven. And Schindler refused, he said, in my factory, you don't burn body, we bury them. And with the religious ceremony with Rabbi Levertov, we bury those people with 10 people going and saying the, the religious Kaddish. And they are buried until today, they are buried over there next to Catholic cemetery. We got a piece of land from the church because they didn't want them to be buried in Catholic cemetery. How the, the condition in Brinlitz? The, the condition was, I would was say- Was it a camp? There was a camp surrounded with barber wire and, and everything, with German guards, with towers and everything, like any other camp. But they have no right to camp to the factory. He didn't allow them to do anything. But he bribed this guard. They're giving them a vodka and money and everything. How was the condition, the living condition? The living condition was, I would say, better than any other camp. But remember that everything was but on the black market, sometimes the food was not enough. But one day the, in Brno, the factory was bomb bombarded by Russian, and the Germans were withdrawing from Brno. He went there because he knew a cigarette factory over there. He went loaded with a truck with some friends from garage, brought the cigarettes back to us, and on the way they were stopped by patrol, German patrol, and they asked him, what do you have? He said, cigarette for my Juden. So he gave everybody a pack of cigarettes, and he they one one said no more, meine Juden rauchen auch, my Jews smoking too, and we start to getting cigarettes for which we could get from Czech side some bread or something else. People can exchange it, and he tried very hard, but on the end of the rainbow, he used all his money. He in 1944, Oscar Schindler and Emily Schindler were multimillionaires. In November 44, they could take the money, like Madrid and other people did, you understand? Go to Vienna, to any place in the world, survive the war and be multimillionaire. But he promised the, the Schindler people, the Schindler Jews, the Schindler children, how he called us, that he will stay with us till the five minutes after 12. Tell me, tell and he me. kept the promise. You knew that the Russian army is coming? We knew that the Russian army is coming, and the last night we decided, we disarmed, you know, we disarmed the, the Gestapo. 
the, the you soldiers, mean the, SS? The, the SS. We put them in a trailer. I don't remember how much was over 30, some of them. Some maybe a runaway, I don't know. And we took over on the towers. We put uh, overalls instead of the stripe. We put the army overalls on it. And our, we were, I was having a guard on the main door and we put the sign typhus on it. And I have a pistol from the, uh, the Leipold was sent by Oscar Schindler by the special trick to the Eastern Front, you know. So his second, uh, his name is Mo Mosek. Uh, was only a sergeant, like over Scharfier, you know. I, I disarmed him with my finger. <laughs> I, at night I sneak on him and said, hand and the how was it? And, and then, I took his gun. And then what happened? Schindler just uh, We left. were staying, we decided not to wait for Russian to come over for, to liberate him. We decided to send Schindler with a group of my, some of them my students, to the American zone towards west. And those group took the cars and took Schindler and the German, some engineer, and his wife, and and the group of six or seven people went with them. And by a few days, they surrendered to American army. They, we didn't know what happened to them later on after what's, liberation. What happened with you? We, we stayed there. And? We took over the guard. I was one of the people participating. There was 15 of us, you understand? And we were watching what we said. We, have, we already were armed, you see. One night, I remember about on the ninth, we were in interesting situation. We were in the center of the of Brinlitz. Around the Brinlitz and Sweetow, in a, in a uh, radium about three, four kilometers, was about 100,000 German squeeze, uh, uh, soldiers, army, squeezed between East, the Russian, West, the American, Frenchman, and we were a little point in the center. So we put a big sign, typhus, that nobody should, should enter. But one night, a group of SS, the black shirt SS, came over. They were demanding gasoline. And one of my students who live in Tenenbaum, he's living, living in Australia, I say, Paul, give me a gun. I shoot one. I said, you don't shooting anybody. We give them gasoline and tell them we're not letting him, the people in because uh, the typhus is inside, and there's a labor camp. So we give him gasoline and they left. The whole division of the sh black, b black SS was they were starting shooting inside. And one of the uh, guy was uh, wounded. So and we stayed then? there, we stayed there till about on the 11, three days later, the first Russian major with another soldier came on the horse only two of them. We liberating you. And we were laughing because we were liberated already three days before. But they asked for food, they give us a food, and then they want to make a kangaroo court on those people. And the sentence was of the kangaroo court to execute those SS people. And we stood up against them, said, we are not executing anybody, we are not a killer, and this is not a court of law, this is a kangaroo court. You take them out, we don't want to know about this. Do as what you want. We will not execute anything. But our people hang one couple, a German couple who was a, in Dachau, a son of a bitch. How he came from Dachau to? They were Brindis. sending some people, the the, the German uh, criminal criminals, you know, to be a couple. Tell me, Polik, how you how you received your first hour of liberty when you went out? I was the... I was very bad. I was sick. I was so sick that I don't know what I survived. I, gra I got, I don't know what, or touch of typhus, or yellow jumpies. I was uh, extremely sick, but not me, I would not survive. We, and on other things, my director of my gymnasium in Krakow, Dr. Hirsch, 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 uh, he? he stay, he's MD. There were lots of sick people still in it. He stayed in the camp. He didn't go away to support, and he helped me to get out with us. I stayed about two months, three months. In Brinlitz? In Brinlitz, after the war. So how you came now from Brinlitz is a long way from Brinlitz to Los Angeles. To our brother. We decided, you see, in this time, we have rumors, and some people came back from Poland, that they are pogroms in Poland. The pogroms, why were they started, what happened in it, we don't know exactly. But we know one thing, that the Jews who came over and demand their 
houses or apartment to give them back. Maybe steer them pogrom. I, we, I don't know exactly what happened. But it was in city of Krakow, city in Radom, but it's not far away. And I said to Mila, we knew already in this time that the family don't exist. I knew it that they cannot. And when they survive, we will find out each other for sure, no question about it. You see? So I decided to go to Israel. We decided to go. This was in, in June. May, June, I was about still not feeling well. And we decided to go any way is possible, mostly per Pens Apostolorum, the walking, or grab a train or, or some uh, bower or some, uh, you know, villager give us a ride. We came to Bratislava. In Bratislava, we decided to get to uh, Hungary. So I decided to go first on my own to Hungary, to Budapest to find out that I left Mila in, in uh, thing. Because it was danger and to ride on the train, particularly for women, because the Russian soldier was killing, raping, murdering, beating up people, you understand what I mean? Uh, they were wild animals in this time, particularly in this period of time. I came to Budapest and I found my friend, a very close friend of mine, who lived here in Los Angeles too. And he said, Paul, Go back and bring Mila here because I don't want you to stay in Bratislava because you never know what happened. Hungary is still much better. You could. When I saw the food over there, you know, and the store full of fruits, beautiful and things like this, I said, okay. I went back, and I always carry a little short bayonet for a small. You never know in these days, you know. So I took her with me, and we didn't on the train and was ripping, ripping killing, murdering, throwing people through the window by the Russian. So I stay on the platform, put her in the corner, put a blanket over her and myself with the bayonet in the hand. We arrived in Budapest overnight. And then friend was waiting and we stayed there till about September. Then we decided, we found out that the Russian demand that everybody is going back to their country. No, we didn't have anything to go to the country for. So I said, let's go back and see what we can do maybe in Czechoslovakia. We came to Czechoslovakia, we stay a month in Prague, then we went to Karlovy Vary to Karlsbad, and we stay in there because it was a beautiful resort and it was beautiful fall, yeah, you know. Then we found out that the Russians gave another order that we, everybody has to register themselves and go back to their country. So we went to register as a Czech Czechoslovakian. <laughs> So they asked me where I was born. So I, I was skiing in the border of Hungary and Czechoslovakia in eastern part of Karpaten, Uzok, a small town on the, on, the, on the border in the mountains that I was skiing there. Then the guy is asking me where he was born. I said, in Uzok. You sure you're born in Uzok? You know, he, I don't speak Czech. I speak Polish, trying to convey to him as much as I could in Czechoslovakia, you see. I said, you sure? I said, what do you mean sure? And I tell you, I'm born in Uzog, I'm born in Uzog. How you got in the Uzog? You, you familiar with that? What do you mean I'm familiar? I was skiing there, sure I'm familiar. You're going with the train on the cliff of the mountain to get through the mountains on the south side of the mountains and we come to Uzog. This way they took us back to the camp. You see, oh, then you are from Uzog because I am from Uzog too. <laughs> and give us permission to stay, but we didn't decide with my friend, but I met in Budapest and we were traveling together to go to Germany, to east, from east to west Germany, you see? And we were starting to do in November, and we go on the walking in through the mountains in the deep snow, and we arrive uh, beginning of December to uh, cross the West Germany borders, and we came a few days later to Munich, and then we saw our friends, Rosner and Schindler is there, and everybody is there, so we live together, and I stay over there, but I am not the person that I will run around doing nothing. I decide to do something, so I report to the UNRWA, United Nations Relief Fund, and I told them what was my occupation and everything, and I became a, a, a education center director of UNRWA with headquarters five in Munich, with a job to organize and get children to schools. 
Nobody could organize. I brought 1,700 children to school, promising in their papers that I will give them clothes, food, shelter, and education. And the parents, if they were not orphans, the parents can go and arrange a uh, transfer to other countries or to emigrate to America or to South America or to the, back to their own country. And I have, since 1945, in December till uh, April 1947, 1,700 children. I'm giving them diploma, graduating from high school, graduating from public school. Originally with United Nations Relief Fund, I have the documentation here. When, when you then, how you came to America? And I was working for UNRWA and I applied to America. So they asked me if I have any uh, cousin or family. I said, I have plenty of family. My father was in America. The family of Pfefferberg and family of Gulf, there are plenty of them there. So the highest officer was asking me, do you have the address? I said, my God, I don't have any address. I don't even remember where they live. I know they are in New York because my father was for seven years in New York. So she brought Manhattan book. <laughs> they never live in Manhattan. They probably live in Brooklyn. But she brought it and we opened and I see the Moses Goldfluss, Be uh, Rebecca Goldfluss, about four names Goldfluss. I said, positively, this is my family. Similar names in my family were there in Poland. So they wrote a letter to this. The Pfefferberg was only one. And very soon they came over and said, no from the Goldfuss say that you are family. <laughs> so I said, what the man? But I want to go to America. And only the Pfefferberg mentioned that he may be related to you. I said, see, I have a family there. But they don't want to give money. To, to, so we don't know how we can get. But in between, President Truman received 200,000 permit for display person. And because I was working for the United States government and for the UNRWA, and the major of US Army who was in charge of the whole caserna when I have the 1,700 people, and he likes me very much. And I was teaching him skiing in the Alps. So he said, your birthday is on March 20th in 47 years. You will get a visa this day. And I, on the day of my birthday, he gave me a present visa for me and me. And I, April 17 or 10 or 17, we went to Hamburg. I have the $10 and Mila has the $10 in the pocket. The only money we have. I was making $200 a month from UNRWA, but not the American dollars, only the Alien. I could buy a pack of cigarettes for this $200. We supposed to get paid in American dollars, but somebody was stealing the dollars, replacing with the, 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 you know, the, 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 the thing. So when I came over on the boat, the captain and the doctor and one officer need four guys to play bridge. So they found me, I played bridge with them for the five nights of we were there, and I landed with $105 in America. That was my fortune. And then we stay in New York. I opened a business with the same friend, but we came from Budapest and things. He was a year ahead in America than me, because he has a brother. And he was working for an importer of leather goods from Argentina. So he told him that his cousin is coming, who is a specialist in this field. I never knew how to open the handbag. But when I was introduced to him and he said to me, you know how to repair bag? Look, I was mechanics. I was a welder. I said, I can repair anything. So I start, they hire me too. And I start working and we decided to open a repair shop because he was sending repairs to another place. And the guy charged a lot of money. So we said, we do this for a half price of the other guy. And we started repair to the importer, the bags, what he was bringing. And then look, I went to the library in New York. He need to glaze something or dye something. I pick up the book in German. I read it. This, I went to the store. I bought them. I didn't even know how to call in English the tools when I was buying. I draw them the pictures what I needed because I didn't speak English. I, a word, you see? And we started and we were working and we make some money. Then he got sick and he, the doctor advised him to go to California. So he bombarded me from California every day. Come and come and Freddie was born and I hate New York. I hate him so Freddie much. Freddie is your son. My son was born on March 20th, 
1950, on my birthday, five minutes after 12 at noon. She, Mila didn't have the money to buy me a present. She gave me a song and cost me 500 bucks extra. And Freddy was born, beautiful little boy, you see? And uh, we decided to go. I couldn't stand summer in New York. I couldn't stand winter in New York because we were living in a log island and I have to sh travel with the subway to Manhattan, you know, and it was a horrible things, you know. So you and the amount of money we were making was sufficient to live, not enough to die, you see. But then we were developing more reputation and we started to making. Then I bought my partner who went to, New York, to Los Angeles and I took another partner. Then a year later, in 1950, we decided to come over to California because he was telling me, Paul, you are a skier. Do you ski in New York? I said, no. I shovel the snow in New York in the winter. And I do it like this. I go in the morning to ski in San Bernardino Mountains. In the afternoon, I'm going to Pacific Ocean and with me swim with my little daughter. She, he got daughter. And the same time when Freddie was born, a month later, his daughter was born. And we will have a wonderful time to and work. I have already a store. You will work with me and we will have everything fine. So I said to Mila, what do we have to lose? I sold my part of, of my business to my friend who was partner for $1,500. And I was considered myself, I was a very rich man. And I come over. I didn't want to work anymore for anybody. I opened my little shop in Beverly Hills to grow to a very big, substantial business. I made quite a bit of money, money, good living, and I could save it. I bought a house, I have to pay mortgages, I have to pay taxes, I have everything. Then I decide, and I always talk about the war. I consider the reason that I and Mila survive is a purpose. Other way is no sense that while we survive and what, the other parents. What is your, if you will, must leave a message to the next coming generations and to your grandchildren, what you will say about First all of this all, what in, you went to? In, in the darkest moment of your life, you must think positively that you will overcome this. This is one important. The minute when you decide that you are already uh, without any exit in the darkest situation, then you are doomed to perish. You have to have a hope that you will survive and you will overcome. This is one of the most important. Your mental attitude, spiritual attitude, the strength is in your self to survive then you survive. The second thing, remember that tragedy, what happened, and happened on account, on account of prejudice and hatred. And this is the worst killer. Love is building and hatred is killing. And this is what you have to remember. Love everybody around you with whom you work or cooperate, because this will come back the same way like you're sending to the other people. and mail showing that you respect and love somebody else, the person will show you the same respect and love, and you can create a lot of friendship. And this is proven point in my life. I, you know, you were with me in many places. Around the world, any place you will find, I have somebody who I love and somebody who loves me. And this is what it is. Your attitude toward the people and positive, positive thinking create a strength in, inside of you, what give you a chance to overcome even the most difficult situation in their life. You have also a, a, a daughter, right? Yes, I have a daughter too. Ma Marie was born six years later in 1956, and only two days shorter from my sister's birthday. My sister was born on February, <clears throat> February 9. Marie was born on February 7. And we call, uh, give her a name after Mila's mother, Marie, and after second name as a Pauline after my sister. Tell me, Pauline, one question what everybody's asking you. What's happened then with Schindler? What was your connection when you came all this time in New York, in Los Angeles? We know, you see, I everybody just start, knows. Yeah, I just start to tell you something that I consider that the reason why did we survive, those survivors, there are two reasons. First, that we are the witnesses to the truth what happened. There's no, nobody can challenge what we are talking because we were there. The second, our obligation is to talk about this as long we live, to tell the world 
that inhumanity man to man is the biggest crime ever committed. The humanity man to man is show compassion, love, and respect to another human being. And we have to talk about this. And because I live thanks to a humanity of a man who was a German Catholic, born with one, womanizer, part of a Canaris organi espionage organization, who gambled Vabanko with his life and his money and his wife's life, and he succeed, prove the point that humanity still exists. And because exists, we have to de develop and teach the young people how to love and respect instead but it's much easier because the child is born with a love to mother and to family and to to our to surrounding uh, condition hatred is accumulated through a connection with people who brainwash them or implemented negative aspect to, towards other people and this is what I decided to do. The minute I was liberated, the minute I came to, New, to Munich, the minute I came to New York, the minute I came to Los Angeles, never start talking about this. Many times I had when I came to Jewish Federation that we want to organize survivor organization and we would like to make a Yom HaShoah in 1953. They said, forget it. You are in America, you don't have to remember, you are starting brand new. I said, when we forget it, we all doomed to perish again. We can never perish. your family please. Uh, he will pat you on the back. Sorry. No, I would like to introduce my family, but uh, in one concern I'm very lucky. Mila and I will survive the Holocaust. We are blessed with a son who was born in on March the 20th, 1950 on my birthday as my birthday present. And then six years later Marie was born. Fred is behind me. Marie is standing next to it. And Judy, who is a, a, my numero uno daughter-in-law, is standing on my left side. On my right side is Samantha, my also numero uno granddaughter. She will be 13 years of age in May. And June. June. In June, I'm sorry, in June. I'm very sorry, in June. And he's extraordinary human being. He knows what means humanity meant to man and inhumanity meant to man. And on the left side, in my wonderful young fellow, Matthew, my grandson, I adore this guy. We are the best friends. And he's only nine years old, going on 10. And he's a wonderful human being. He knows about, and the most important thing, he went to library a couple of weeks ago and rented a book. You wouldn't believe it, what kind? Schindler List. He wants to know exactly what happened, what is written about grandma and grandpa. And he loves to what he's reading. And I'm a very happy man. After the tragedy, in hell, I'm now in heaven. In seven heaven. <laughs> Can I ask one question, Fred? Sure. You know all these things what's happened to your father and your mother, and uh, you know, you know, you, are, you was living with them, you know, all the activity your father made for Schindler. Actually, he was the initiator for Schindler's List. And what do you think? What, what kind of experience you're taking from your father's life? Uh, uh, the only thing that I really got from what my father has done is never give up. 
and uh, it, it's so true what he has done for Schindler's List and not only for himself but all the survivors to get the story told and on record um, that this was basically a 50-year quest of his and as you know the first Neville was in 1963 and that was 31 years ago and you know where we're at now so basically never give up that's what I've learned Hey Marie, what do you get from your mother? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> how love, how to... Can, can we pass? What? Uh, he passes. Can you, what, you want to tell us something like, what do you think about Schindler List? Well, I, n I never saw the movie, and I think if I saw it, mm. it would be like a good movie. And um, if I saw the movie, I would learn something from it. That's right. Learn what? Never to give up and to, and, love and to love people. And like when people are in trouble, um, you should just help them. How to help them? Yeah. Do you have something to say to that, Samantha? Well, I saw a movie and it was kind of loud, but it was cool. And I saw, well, Papa told me like all that, all that stuff about it, and then I saw it, and it was cool. And I met Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, she said that. Yeah. She met Jerry. <laughs> well, met Jerry Mullen. <laughs> we love you. We love you. This picture was made in 1936 in Krynica in Poland, resort area, my beautiful resort place. On this picture I see my mother, the second from the left, Mina Pfefferberg, and my sister, Polinka Pfefferberg, as a young girl, just after the high schools, and trying to get to university, and the rest is the cousin and the aunts uh, from my mother's side. They were under vacation in Krynica in Poland. The date of this photo is around 19, 1936, just before the tragedy was struck uh, Jewish people from 1939. The last name of those people are uh, family name, but only I give the name of my mother, Mina Pfefferberg, and my sister, Polinka Pfefferberg, the other people's name already faded away from my memory. This picture was taken in, my sister was uh, this time 22 years old, was taken in Krakow during the vacation time. And this was in 1936 or 38, the exact date, I don't know. This picture I received by coincidence about two months ago, today we have a December the 6th, from a gentleman from Israel who saw the picture Schindler list, but I was involved in it with the story of Mr. Oscar Schindler, and he sent me those pictures, and he said that he, in this time, in 1938, he was in big uh, adoration of my sister, he was in love with her, and he, he dated her for two years, but the war started, they were separated. He survived and lived in, our, in Israel. My sister didn't survive. She perished with her husband in 1944, got caught on the uh, false paper, on the Irish area paper, and she was executed in Warsaw. My picture, wait, wait, wait. this is my picture, was taken in 1938 during the summer activities. I was uh, trying to get the golden pin in athletics, and I received it, and I proudly wear it in my lapel, and this picture was made by a friend of mine, and I'm very handsome. I see how handsome I was when I was, uh, this was in 19, I was 25 uh, and a half years old. This is a very interesting picture. This is the only picture that I have as a teacher with a graduating class in, in June 1939. There was a co-ed gymnasium in Częstochowa, 
and this is a group of those children who just passed the examination with all the teachers who were teaching in the class. And I am here the third from left in the last row. And people say that I didn't change in the last 55 years too much. Anyway, this was a bright young people there. Some of them survived. Received this picture about two weeks ago from Belgium from one of the students who found that I am alive here after watching the Schindler list in Belgium. And she sent me this photo. And I'm thankful to her for it. Because the only photo from this group, there are four girls. This is the girl who sent it. The first row in the left, the little girl, this is the girl who survived and sent me the picture. Then the third, oh my God, uh, you're asking the name, oh, brother, I have on the tip of my things. I've just uh, escaped my memory. She lives in Belgium. The next one is uh, p uh, another student who is third from right in the first row. She is a doctor over there. And her name was Pauline Masuvna. Now she's married. I don't recall her married name. And they are another students who stay uh, uh, on the left side of me, second from the left in Tabro, Vice Ferner, and he lives here someplace in the United States. I don't have his address. Those are the only people what I knew that survived from this group of children. And this was made in Częstochowa in the front of our high school when I was the priv privilege to be a teacher in this particular period of time. This is very extraordinary picture, it was made in Bydgoszcz in, 1990, in 1934, when I was in the officer school, there was the first uh, uh, exam, we passed the first examination and we got the first bar as an officer candidate. And I am in the second row, the, uh, what was the, Six in the second rows, I am the six from the right between the two. I'm the fifth from the right between the two officers sitting in the front. I remember the officer who is sitting in the front to me on the left side is Polucznik Halamoyski, extraordinary Polish officer. I don't know if he survived. I tried to locate it. He was numero uno officer. And then is the commandant of the school and a general sitting next to, on the left side of the uh, commandant of the school, with his son, uh, the, the three best students were the son of the general, who's sitting in the first row on the left side, and, uh, and the, another candidate officer in this first row who was second, and I was the third no, in the whole group. Uh, the first three, we, were, we finished at the officer school in Bydgoszcz in the rank of sergeant officer candidate in Bydgoszcz, Poland. The school officer was one of the toughest in Poland, and I had a privilege to become an officer of Polish army on a special occasion. On November 11, 1938, they select on a case of the 20th anniversary of Polish independence after the First World War, they nominated 1,000 new officers to the Polish reserve, and I was one Jew between one the thousand, we received our insignia and our diploma from the hands of President of Poland, Mr. President Moschitsky. And this was on November 11, 1938. And it was a very memorable day for me because not too many officers Jewish, uh, of Jewish religion was elevated to this rank in this particular period of time. This photo is very memorable photo to me because I became officer of Polish army on special occasion on November 11, 1938, the 20th anniversary of Polish independence. After the First World War, uh, Polish uh, Ministry of War selected 1,000 officer candidates for this special occasion to elevate them to the rank of first lieutenant. And I was only the one Jews over there during the ceremony. The uniform, the boots, the sabre, the pistol, the, and, and the, all the uh, parts of the uniform, I received special payment of thousands of lotus, what was a tremendous amount of money. Uh, the government pay for everything. And this was the most memorable day because I was proud that I was the only Jew nominated uh, the lieutenant. I have a privilege on account of this 
to teach also in high school the ROTC. And this opened tremendous amount of possibility for me to receive a very good job because I have a master degree, I was a title of professor, and I also have a right to teach ROTC, but what became a subject in Polish high school, like any other subject. Poland was between Germany and Russia, and both the country would like to put their hand and grab part of the Poland and exit to their country. And I think so the officer, the low ranking officer were very good trained. The high ranking officer was rotten. <laughs> The place of this photo was done in the front of my high school in Krakow when I was teaching in Hebrew gymnasium in the city of Krakow, the best school in Poland, uh, scholastically acclaimed. Date of the photo is November 1938, uh, by end of November 1938, I don't remember the exact date. I was nominated on November the 11th, so this was after November 11, 1938. This picture I made in 1974 when I was in Poland, when I was interviewed on Polish television, and I showed them the part of the ghetto, the reminiscences of the wall, what was built around the ghetto in the city of Podgorz, there's a suburb of Kraków. And there were still pieces of glass on the top of it because they were over the, the top of the wall with lots of cut glasses so people couldn't go over the wall the way they cut themselves. Now they are only this remnants, now is even less than this left over there in Poland because city was growing up and that's all what it is, what is left. But there are still some parts of the wall but we were filming later on in 1993, uh, 94 when we were preparing for the movie Schindler List. This photo was made by me when I was on one of the visits to Poland. I don't remember if it was 74 or 82 because I, every couple of years we were going to Poland because we have on the Jewish cemetery in Lodz the monument of family of my wife and we have to keep this in a decent condition. Now my, our room was on the second floor above this rim going over there, the first two window on the right side. While I picked up this particular house, when I was looking to where we will be uh, living in ghetto, was a good purpose because this side of the building was all sealed. The door and the entrances and lower window was sealed with the cement because this part of the uh, uh, side of this part was already Irish uh, uh, side not the ghetto side. The house was in the ghetto. Then when you look on the balcony and the, the two windows on the right side, you will see that is a little like a passage. And next to the corner on the right side is a pipe. As a good sportsman, I was not afraid to go there and slide down and be on the uh, Irish side and the, on the uh, uh, Polish uh, population side. But I never used the pipe because we have other ways to get out from the ghetto. This photo was this house. We live in this particular house from March 1941 till March 1943 during the ghetto time. And after the liquidation, we were sent from the ghetto to Camp Plashov till uh, 1944 and then to Brynitz. And then we were liberated on May the 8th, 1945. The house still is in Poland and still a good friend of my family lives in this house who were in the ghetto and lived there too. This photo is part of the camp in Krakow Plaszów. The picture was taken by Mr. Raymond Tisch, a Viennese gentleman who was working for Madrid. He was making this photo of camp and nobody even know why he was doing this thing. The SS positively didn't knew it or the way they will uh, liquidate him. This looked like he was making them for future uh, use in after liberation. I was lucky to get these pictures from him and we have the copy of the life in the camp. This is beginning of building the camp. This is a part of the SS uh, barracks or some other officers who were there. This picture was taken in 1943. 
This picture is made also by Mr. Raymond Teach, and is a part of the life in the camp of Krakow Plashov, the concentration camp. The photo was taking place, I don't know exactly what year, but this was probably late in 1943. This is when they are bringing, supposed to be a soup in the morning, and they're giving the, uh, the spoon of soup, but this was not a soup, this was a water with some beads inside, nothing else, not nourishment whatsoever. But the interesting story about Mr. Raymond Tisch, I noticed working in the garage that he was making this picture in a strange way, always behind the corner of a barrack or through a window, so that nobody could see him that he's making this picture. And I, after the war in 1963, I decided to find Mr. Tisch, and I found him in Vienna, I went to Vienna, I met Mr. Teach and I asked him, hey, Mr. Teach, I want the pictures you were making. He denied that he was making any picture, but I got information from my friends in Vienna that his wife is gravely ill and need a special medication that he cannot get no place. So I went to him again and I said, listen, I know you have the picture. I give you $500 and I put five bills on the table and I buy for your wife all the medication you cannot buy it here, only in the United States, and I send that to you, give me those photos. Then he start to say, okay, I have these photos, and I give you tomorrow. Why not today? Because they are, not, they are not at home. We made a date for Friday afternoon around six o'clock. This was in November, so it was a very dark night. He took me about two blocks away from his home to a little square when it was a monument for some hero of Austria. He dig out a, in a corner and take a metal box and then he give me my money back and he said, I give you the film, but I cannot take the money from you. I said, why did we make a deal? Because I don't know if these photos are any good. I made this, you know, in 1943 and 44 and they were get very not developed in the ground. I said, the deal is deal, you keep the money, and I will take the photo. Then he said, on one condition, you will not show this photo to nobody that you got them from me, because he was afraid of the underground of SS Odessa. I promised to him, and I got a little scared, Friday in the evening, what to do with the hot potato like this. But next day, I decided to go to Israel, and Saturday night, when the flight, was, because during this Saturday, the flights were not going to Israel, because they are holiday there. I came to Israel about 11 o'clock at night. I took the taxi to Jerusalem. I called my friend from Yad Vashem, and I told him I have film who never was developed. We have to develop the film. Next day in the morning, we developed this film on Sunday morning. And there were three Leica uh, rolls of film, 106 photo, and they came all in perfect condition. Like miracle happened that the photo and film who was in the ground for 20 years survived that we, the future generation, can see what happened during the period in this particular camp, Krakow Prussia between 1943 and the end of 1945. This photo was made in Budapest in, in September of 1945. We were staying in Budapest. We were trying with Mila to get to Israel, but we got stuck in Budapest because the Russians closed the border between Hungary and Romania. We couldn't get to Constance, and we must to go back to Germany to try through, that, through Germany to get to Israel. And we were staying in a, a private home, but we were using the famous hotel gallery every day for recreation purposes. They have a beautiful uh, swimming pool and I was a good swimmer. You see my hair is still very short because when I was liberated uh, in May, I didn't have, I was bald headed. And now that I have a little nice hair coming back. And I pretty looks pretty good and pretty strong. The place is Budapest, 1945 in September. I found out during the war that my sister was on false paper and hiding someplace in Warsaw, but I didn't know what happened to her and her husband. 
and her name was, her husband name was Eddie Diamond, and Paulinka Pfefferberg became Paulinka Diamond. They were on false paper in Warsaw. Got they, after the war, I found out they got caught and executed in Palmyrev Forest. This is about 15 or 20 kilometers outside Warsaw. I went to this place. This was in 19. 71, I think so. I don't remember the date. And this is a forest with forest of crosses and tombstone with David Starr with no names. So I took a place when it was cross and David Starr tombstone next to each other to prove that the Jew and the Catholic can live together when they died in peace. Maybe this is a symbol that they should live together in peace, the Jews and any other religion together, not waiting when they get buried. This photo is a memorable photo. This is a photo made in November 1963 in the Plaza uh, uh, Atonea in Paris, when I brought Schindler from Frankfurt, Germany to Paris to give him $50,000 and make him again respectable her director with, because the money for him was extremely important. He was a very generous man. And the difference looking at the two faces, I was exactly 50 and a half years old and he was almost 54. So it was not a big difference in age, but with the face of this man, the happiness in his eye. And in this time, in 1963, I found out that Schindler don't have even a quarter for, to buy a pack of cigarettes. And I got the money from MGM studio for selling his life story, the Oscar Schindler story, or Oscar, a story about Oscar Schindler's art to MGM studio. And they pay me $50,000 and I give it to him the money and brought the money to him in part to Paris and I can tell you the story about this moment are unbelievable story but they are more private now than anything else so we leave this to the private occasion you know this photo is showing Oscar Schindler in New York in New Jersey when two of his of his survivor of his children uh, Zuckerman and uh, Pontier became a very successful builder and they promised when they were leaving New, uh, Europe that when they will ever have a chance to put a Schindler's street or Schindler place they will do it now they built 17 town in every town is or Schindler place or Schindler street or Schindler's drive or Schindler place in every of the town is his name and they adore him. This picture was made in 1971 when he was invited in New York. He was already a few times inv invited to Beverly Hills by me and a few times invited by other Schindler Jews in New York or Florida and where they live. This is also a very remarkable photo. I notified Holy Father about Schindler's story. He knew about this not only from this particular period of time when I told him about this, but also before, because he's born in Krakow, in the city of Wadowice, about 20 kilometers south of Krakow, and he knew about Schindler during the time when he was in the uh, university and after the war when he was Archbishop of Krakow, he became a cardinal and pope. And he, I got invitation to come to Rome. I was on the way from Poland to Rome, and we stopped and we were invited for Holy Father, who is on the left side. And behind in the back is his best friend, high school students, high school uh, colleague from public high school. Uh, since they were born, Jerzy Kluger, who is a distant relative to us, then is my wife and myself, and also his secretary and photographer was one. It was a private audience. We spent about 15, 20 minutes. I didn't have a present because I wasn't sure what to do to Holy Father. He doesn't need anything. But I was coming from Poland and I carry a wonderful book printed in Poland about translated the, the uh, what is titled of the book was Polish Jew 
history and culture in a beautiful edition. And when I give it to Holy Father with my dedication, when you're watching his face, how wonderful smile he has, and he thanked me for the book and say, you know, Mr. Page, everybody promised me the book, but nobody will give it to me. Thank you very kindly. This was October 1985. A remarkable moment of meeting Holy Father, wonderful human being, tremendous, valuable, knowledgeable man, one of the best pope ever the history of 2000 years of Christianity, who is sitting over there on the throne, and he walk not only over there in Vatican, but he goes to every country, kiss the ground, and tell the people that he is the important person who will lead them to freedom. <laughs>